So in the last part of our lecture, we discuss about the external structures of bacteria, or rather of the prokaryotes. Now we will be discussing about the internal structures. So the one of the, of course, when you talk about internal structures, it's about the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is the gel-like solution of water and uh, water and organic and inorganic substances. So the cytoplasm is the general internal environment of the prokaryotes. So this contains all of the internal structures of your bacteria. So the next one is, of course, the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane, which is, of course, it serves as the boundary between the inner and the outer structures. And then you have the nucleoid region. So this, since the bacteria or the prokaryotes do not have nucleus, so they have a region where the genetic material is concentrated. So there's no boundary because uh, having a nucleus means you have a boundary between the cytoplasm and the, of course, the nucleus, the internal structure of the nucleus. So, since bacteria do not have a nucleus, they just have a region where the chromosomes, the genetic material is concentrated, and that is their nucleoid region. So, aside from these uh, structures, we also have the ribosomes, where the synthesis of proteins occur. So, let's look at the plasma membrane. So, the plasma membra membrane is the fluid, uh, it's a very fluid phospholipid bilayer embedded with proteins. We call it a fluid membrane because of course their consistency is similar to the oil when you mix it with water it's actually that consistency so it's very uh, fluid it's dynamic but of course there is a clear separation between the inside and the outside so it is embedded with proteins so these proteins can help to regulate the passage of materials into and out of the cell and of course the flu so the phospholipid bilayer also has like that it's a barrier so the, we have uh, several types of transport here, the passive transport, the facilitated diffusion, and the active transport. So aside from those regulation and regulation of the passage of material into and out of the cell, the plasma mem membrane also contains enzymes and enzyme complexes. So sometimes the enzymes are fixed to the membrane and that's where the reactions happen. So they are also involved in communication. So they have external structures that, uh, that can serve as signals. They can also um, allow uh, signaling molecules to permeate. So here is the structure of your plasma membrane. So uh, show, this also shows the three different types of uh, flow or three different types of transportation of materials. So we have the simple diffusion where the material just simply passes through the membrane. So it only happens for hydrophobic materials and non-polar, well basically non-polar and hydrophobic are the same. So small and hydrophobic materials. The reason is because your membrane is actually non-polar. So it repels any polar material. So what does those polar materials do to enter the interior? So they rely on the proteins, protein channels. So they can either enter through facilitated diffusions where the movement is because of the, or rather the movement is driven by the concentration gradient or by active transport where you expend energy to move the materials because you are moving them against the concentration gradient. Sorry. So the next one is the nucleoid region. So it's the region containing the chromosome. So the bacterial chromosome is a circular chromosome that contains uh, around 0.5 to 10 million base pairs in it. So it's much smaller because in the eukaryotes, they are in the billions. So chromosomes is highly folded and twisted to fit inside the cell. So if it's not, uh, it's not if it's not um, properly uh, folded or packed, so they, they they can experience breaks and damage to the DNA. So it's just like a, a spool of thread. So if you do not actually uh, manage properly your thread, it's a very very long thread. So you we can actually have um, tangles and it can it can break. So it contains thousands of genes that allow the bacteria to adapt to ever-changing environments. So aside from that, we also have the ribosomes. The ribosomes are the smallest functional structures in bacterial cells. So they, compo they are composed of two subunits, the large and the small. So uh, you have, remember, the 70S subunit. So it's made of proteins and ribosomal RNA. So this, the, the ribosome is uh, mostly made up of the ribosomal RNA, a type of nucleic acid. That's, that's the fourth 
type of biomolecule and then you also have the protein attachments so the ribosomes are involved in the translation process so although it's a 70s when they divided or when they segregated or separated the two subunits they form a 50s and a 30s subunit so the, the total is 80 but uh, basically uh, this is the 70s prokaryotic ribosome is 70s so that the reason why uh, 50 plus 30 is not equal to 70 well basically the 50s that means the density is uh, at around uh, 50s density that's for the large subunit and the small subunit is around the 30s uh, region uh, in terms of density and they separated it so that's the reason why not because uh, because of the addition factor or anything it's because of the way the the experimental uh, data that they had so aside from the ribosomes, you also have the plasmid. These are genes. These are genetic elements that are extra chromosomal. So that means they are part. They are not part of the chromosomes itself. So they are just add-ons to the uh, to these uh, molecules. So just like uh, some software. So you have the main software, and then you you can also include add-ons. So they range from one to hundreds of genes. So they can exist as one or multiple copies in the cell. And they can replicate independently of the chromosome. They are actually in, in, independent of the, uh, the the DNA from the chromosomes. Although they are also DNA. They are small circular DNA that are independent of the DNA in the chromosomes. They confer advantages to the bacteria just like how in software packages when you install add-ons. So you can have um, additional, of course, additional functions. So some of those functions that they confer to the bacteria are antibiotic resistance. And... Actually, these uh, plasmids can be transferred from one bacteria to another through the pedus. So, the next one are the inclusion bodies. These are the small cytosplasmic structures, the composition of which varies with the species. So, they are quite diverse, many different inclusion bodies, depending on the species of the bacteria. So, they often act as the storage depot. So, they can be used to store carbon or energy polymers, such as the PHA and glycogen. So, PHA is a type of a polymer polybeta hydroxyalkanoid actually there was a study before about phb this time it's polyhydroxybutyrate so polyhydroxybutyrate is actually uh, can be used to manufacture uh, materials plastic materials basically it's a polymer but it is it can be synthesized by the bacteria so there was an attempt to actually culture micro uh, in a industrial scale culturing of this um this bacteria to produce the PHB so that instead of um, chemical manufacture of plastics, it's actually a organism based, uh, microorganism based uh, manufacture of this polyhydroxy butyrate. So, aside from that, there is a storage of molecules needed for biosynthesis. So you have phosphate, phosphate, pho polyphosphate granules and the sulfur granules for uh, basically phosphorus and sulfur storage. So, storage of enzymes, carboxysomes, and enterosomes. So the carboxysome stores rubisco for uh, carbon dioxide fixation in autotrophs and enterosomes for uh, degradation of the toxic compounds. They can also be used to trap gas to confer buoyancy to your uh, bacteria, to your prokaryotes, especially seen in um, aquatic, uh, in the bacteria that uh, lives in aquatic environment, where especially if they are photosynthetic where they want to be near, always near the surface because that's where the light is. Because the light can only penetrate a certain distance or a few centimeters into the water. Then you have magnetotaxis on some uh, magnetic, uh, magnetically uh, bacteria that are sensitive to magnetic fields. And then some are for photosynthetic use, such as the thylakoid. So here are some examples of the inclusion bodies. So... Uh, basically, here are carboxysomes on the left, and this one on the right are the thylakoids. So, uh, these are electron microscope image. So, this is transmission, electron microscope images. So, you can see inside the cell with the TEM. So, aside from that, we had also the endospores. So, not all, not all prokaryotes can produce endospores, but those that can produce spores or uh, spore-forming bacteria. So, these are the endosporic this are, uh, when you say spore-forming bacteria, we are re pertaining to the endospores, not the plant spores. So we ha these are dormant cells, highly resistant to harsh environmental conditions. And this is a problem in most food and beverage companies where they want to pasteurize their products. Because be 
uh, if you have a contamination of the spores in the in the product even if you pasteurize your product you will still end up with a contaminated product so most of some of them are pathogenic so endospore resistance makes them difficult to remove from environment or treat with antibiotics because of this um uh, because these actually are like seeds of bacteria so here is the endospore so this is a life cycle of an endospore forming bacteria so here is your vegetative cycle so basically your bacteria uh, moving uh, if it's in the if it's in the favorable condition so it's it uh, replicates by itself but when it uh, when it so happens that the there is a harsh environment there is a lack of nutrients or there is extreme heat the, the bacteria senses extreme heat so it forms a spore a force spore inside them so it stores its genetic material inside and then it forms a small seed containing its genetic material that is protected by pe peptidoglycan layers inside your cell and then uh, that layer is further reinforced with a thick protective spore coat, which is impermeable to some acids, antibiotics, and even heat. So it's resistant to heat or even um, harsh conditions. Uh, acids, uh, extreme uh, concentrations of, uh, say, say, highly saline concentrations. So those are some issues with uh, some of that. So they are impervious. So this spore coat is like a seed. So when uh, during harsh uh, conditions, even if this bacteria gets destroyed, for example, ant antibiotic or even pasteurization, so this this uh, outer bacteria here is destroyed. The inner uh, seed inside is protected. So it's just like an escape capsule for the bacteria. So you have uh, this is free endospore, which will uh, which can grow into its uh, fully grown vegetative bacterial cell. So that's your endospore. So that's why it's a problem. So it's just like your bacteria having a, yeah, a, a, an escape capsule. So in case of um, damages to the main body, it can escape. And then that capsule can be used to uh, create a new bacterial cell. So uh, for in terms of uh, evolutionary lineage, so you have two distinct lineages for prokaryotes, the bacteria and the archaea. So be that is because uh, this lineage is from comparing their ribosomes but not only that but they have as they are quite distinct in terms of their biochemical activities so the third domain is said to have derived from archaea the, the eukaryotes the eukaryotes is thought to be more much related or they evolve from your archaea that's the theory but anyway the, the one the reason why they said that is because their genetic makeup is similar to archaea than the bacteria actually Comparing bacteria and archaea, archaea is, is closer to the eukarya than they are to bacteria, even though both bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes. So, basically, it looks like this one. So, you have this um, lineage of the bacteria, and then this archaea and eukarya are much more closely related, where they branch off. They have more, co uh, there is a common, or rather, they have greater commonality with each other than to these bacteria. So this is your archaea. The archaea, if you remember, these are the extremophiles. And then the eukarya is the eukaryotes. So aside from uh, this classification, we can use DNA and 16S rRNA sequences to determine relatedness. So before, the classification was based purely on, not exactly purely, but mostly on morphology, how it looks like under the microscope, how it uh, appears when you stain them and some of its um, biochemical or uh, biochemical activities. For example, does it produce acid? Uh, is it an acidic bacteria? So when you culture them, it produces acid. Does it produce a certain type of um, organic uh, substance? Something like that. So uh, that is mostly a laboratory behavior, a laboratory-based behavior, and it actually takes time. Culturing takes time. So you have uh, the new, uh, the, the faster one that we are now using, the modern way, is basically just getting the sequence of their 16S rRNA. And then we can uh, actually group them into their phylum, genus, and uh, actually uh, species, and even some traits. So here are some uh, classifications, so uh, phylum. So we have the actinobacteria, so under them we have your uh, mycobacterium, propionibacterium, and the streptomyces. So and each of them has their own general characteristics so i won't um discuss each and every one of them so i'll just leave them to you to read on your own so these are the other 
um, classification. So you can pause this video to read them properly. So these are the plantomyces, proteobacteria, and then the last one, the spirus, uh, spirum spirochetes, senericurates, and dermatogae. Okay, so these are some classifications. These are the classifications of your bacteria. Now, in terms of the clinical classification, so this is a bit uh, different from the classification we have using the 16S rRNA. Because this one was used uh, in by clinicians since uh, since before uh, sequencing is sequencing and gene uh, uh, DNA based or nucleic acid comparison has been the norm. So they the main characteristic char characterization or classification they rely on cell shape arrangement and biochemical properties. This is the old version, but still being used in most clinics because not all clinics and hospitals has the um, capacity, it has the, um, this, the hardware to actually perform genetic sequencing, even especially here in the Philippines. So only a few select um, institutions have their own gene sequencing apparatus. Actually, if I remember correctly, UP has one, but uh, that's in UP Diliman. I don't think UP Manila has a sequencer, but well, those are some uh, limitations. So prokaryotic species are a group of genetically similar individuals adapted to life in similar environment. And they, uh, they classify subspecies as groups within a species that demonstrate consistent identifiable variations. And then, aside from that, uh, a bit more particular, you have the strains. So the strains are smaller, important genetic differences within subspecies. So we can classify them as species, and then within the species, you have the subspecies, and then within the subspecies, you have the strains. So, uh, and then aside from the strain, there's a much more particular one, which is the serotype. So it's a strain identifiable on the basis of the antibody response to surface molecules. So this is based on what molecules are present on their surfaces. Although they have the same genetic makeup, exactly the same, but they do not really express the same genes. So that's the serotype. So you have your clinical classification of bacteria. So they usually uh, classify them as gram-positive or gram-negative as a functional classification because that's how uh, that it serves as the guide on how to administer and what uh, what antibiotic to administer and so this ends this concludes our lecture about prokaryotes so copyright to john wine and sans e for this uh, lecture materials so see you on the next lecture